Psalms 32, verses 1 through 11, The Joy of Forgiveness, of David A. Maskill. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat, Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave my guilt of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and show you the way to go. With my eye on you, I will give counsel. Do not be like a horse or mule without understanding that must be controlled with bit and bridle or else it will not come near you. Many pains come to the wicked, but the one who trusts in the Lord will have faithful love surrounding him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice your righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I don't know about you, but I'm about tired of all this COVID stuff. Now, I appreciate our leadership really taking a stance of looking out for those, especially those with high risk factors. But I, I am absolutely longing for the time where I can see you guys all again face to face, where we can be in this place and we can hug on each other. I do know, I mean, July 12th, I cannot wait for that time to be here so that we can actually worship in person. Now, not long ago, I decided to buy a mask online and I'm kind of reg <laughs> regretting that a little bit because in ordering it, I didn't realize that this was made of cotton. And I don't know if you can see, but both inside and out, there are a lot of barriers, a lot of layers in this. And I will tell you that it is pretty unforgiving when I'm trying to breathe through this. And that got me thinking about how we're looking, when we're looking at Psalm 32 today, about how those barriers of sin in our lives just really hold us back from being who God wants us to be, from being in his presence, from being attached and connected to his ever loving heart. We really want to work from that state and from being in that state to more to living out a life that is living to the rhythm of God's forgiveness. We want to totally be entrenched in who he wants us to be, completely at peace and centered on his will. Now we see that in Psalm 32, this is actually an instructional psalm. So one of the first things you'll see is that it actually says Mekil at the, very, at the top, and that Mekil actually means instruction. So we know that this psalm is actually a psalm of instruction. So David, after going through some insane trials with his own sin, he is now able to be able to really kind of teach the people. And we actually see that in Psalm 51, verses 10 through 13. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Now, through a little bit of research, we find out that actually Psalm 51 actually was written before Psalm 32. So he actually takes very serious this claim where he says, I'm going to go out and teach transgressors your ways, the ways of forgiveness, so that they will return to you. Because now we see in Psalm 32, we see this instructional psalm, which is really pushing people to be centered in God again. And with David doing through all this, this was actually written as a response to his affair with Bathsheba. And, and if you're not familiar with that story, it's essential that he was looking over his balcony one night, saw a lady taking a shower, shouldn't have been looking, but seeing her and seeing how beautiful she was, he started com to commit adultery in his heart and then decided to go and meet with her, uh, have an affair with her, 
she became pregnant, and then it escalated to the point where he had to actually murder his best friend who was married to her. And in this, even though he goes through all of this, he goes through all this sorrow, he goes through all this repentance, he goes through all this hurt, we see that it brings him back to a place where he is still one with God because we even still know that we read in Scripture where David is considered to be a man after God's own heart. So what really drives a man to go and carry that burden and that depth of need for forgiveness all the way to a place where he is considered to be a man after God's own heart. And I think that's as we move along that path, we start seeing that the first step really is to accept God's forgiveness. We, we have a, a wonderful story, and in each person who calls upon the name of the Lord to be, to be his God and Savior, we know that each one understands that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed. But far too often, I see that people are really stuck and not really wanting to accept that. They think that, you know, through the shame and guilt of things that they have done in their past, that they have to hold on to it, that they have to be slave to those things, that they can't just admit it and move on and actually live the life of forgiveness that God claims. And we see that there are so many benefits that if you truly tap in to who God wants you to be and truly tap in to living a life to his forgiveness, there are so many benefits that you get to enjoy. One of the benefits we see in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. We see that that sin is covered. And then when he's talking about that sin being covered, he means that sin is actually completely away from view. So imagine, you know, we're talking about this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And then I'm not, going to put it, I'm not going to put it under a bushel. Because if we put it, our light under the bushel, it is completely covered. But that's what God does actually with our sin. When we call upon his name, when we repent those sins, he puts it under a covering. We no longer see that sin. And that's what he wants for you. He wants to be there with you, covering your sins with his blood so that you may be more centered with him. The next, another benefit that we get is in verse 2 uh, from Psalm 32. And it says, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no inequity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. We get to see how God counts that sin as nothing against us. I mean, think about that for a second. It's like as if you had never sinned in the first place. There's too many times when we grab a hold of something that we've done and that we hold on to it because we feel unworthy and we feel so much guilt and shame over it that we clamor and we hold on to it. But that's not what God tells you to do. God says to let it go. He says to, to release it because he is going to purge it from you as if you had never sinned. That's one of the hardest things that I've ever had to grapple with because I know how much of a sinner I am. And the, and the horrible things that I did, especially before my salvation, I remember all those things that I, I mean, I still remember all those things that I did, but I understand, I understand that those have been purged, that they are no more. It is as if I had never sinned before. In Romans 5, 8, we see, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's through that blood, through that covering, that we are one and centered in God. So we always have to look at that. With that sin, he is literally taking that burden off of you. So think about that right now as you're watching this. Think about something that you know that you're holding on to. But if you lay that at the foot of God, if you lay that at the feet of Jesus Christ, he is going to take that sin and he is going to cast it away. And that is a beautiful love story. That is the story that he wants for you. There is no tricks. There is no other demands, but that you give your life to Christ. If you need for forgiveness for something, if you know something that has burned your heart, I beg you today, get on your knees, pray to God, hand it over to him, and it will be as if it never existed. Another great benefit 
to this is in verse 10 that says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. We get to know his steadfast love, and we know that more and more through the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to take a moment and think about, let's go back to high school. Those who are in high school, not too far of a stretch. Now, I want you to imagine that there's this valedictorian, and that person has worked tirelessly, made in an incredible amount of sacrifices to get to where they are. So they are the top of their class, probably perfect grade point average, whole nine yards. Their future is set wonderfully in front of them. They probably have so many opportunities that are just awaiting them. Colleges knocking down their door just to go there. Now take an imagine of the person with the lowest grade point average for that class. That person has maybe even just struggled to even get the lowest amount of scores. They perhaps were slackers. They didn't do the things that they were supposed to do. Now imagine that valedictorian wanting to have grace over that person with the lowest GPA and decided to switch the scores to give that person who definitely did not deserve those better opportunities through this, but instead wanted them to have it because they love them. That's what God does for us. He has forgiven our sins so that we may have a brighter future, so that we may be more centered in him, so that we can be really attached and connected with our God, so that we may live out a life that is way more powerful and way more peaceful and without shame than it ever would be just on our own. Another benefit is that we get to rejoice in, so, in verse 11, he says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, all, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In heart. It says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. So benefit of giving our sins off and accepting God's forgiveness is that now we get to worship. We get to rejoice. There is a singing, a song in our heart that gets to play as loud as we could possibly make it. That's why it's so important for us to be evangelists to our community, to be in outreach, to constantly to be looking about how we can spread that same rejoicing. When we accept the forgiveness, we want others to know about it. And then that's how we actually get to now live in forgiveness, to live in the rhythm of of God's beautiful forgiveness. Now in Hebrews 8, 12, it says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. We now get to live in that beautiful understanding of that we get to rejoice in the grace that God has provided us through his son. We get to live now in a life that is full of peace and without shame. And in that beautifulness, that song that sings, if you will, I, I recall like here lately for the past several months, I've actually been able to partner with uh, my homie Dwight Carter in delivering food to teens in need uh, across the east side of Indianapolis. And in doing so, uh, me and, uh, as I call him, D-Wing, because he's my wingman, we actually uh, kind of turn our church van into <laughs> to a bit of a concert hall uh, because we crank the radio and, and we just worship with all of our might while we get to serve the Lord. And in doing all this, one of our favorite songs is of late that's been uh, coming over the radio. Uh, it's called Holy Water by We the Kingdom. And in it, it actually talks about what, and it really illustrates what God's forgiveness is. And it says, your forgiveness is like sweet honey on my lips, is like the sound of symphony to my ears, to the holy water, like holy water on my skin. And it talks about not wanting to abuse his grace. If you haven't heard the song, I mean, absolutely listen to it and join <laughs> Dwight and I in the van as we proclaim that aloud because it sets such a beautiful example of what forgiveness is. Because forgiveness isn't this drudgery thing where, well, I just have to repent and I'm going to be beat down. No, that forgiveness is like sweet honey to your lips, is like a symphony to your ears is like holy water that is moisturizing to your skin. 
That's what forgiveness is. And David understood that gift. And that is why he so yearned and groaned day and night to be in that place of forgiveness with God. He yearned to be in sinnerness with God, to not be dried up. Because it says in verse 3 through 4, as he sought repentance, with God, it says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. He knew he was in a hard place and that he had to repent, that he had to turn his eyes, his soul, his life back to God. Because without that, he would not taste that sweet honey. He would not hear that symphony in his ears. He would not have that moisturizing holy water on his skin. And that's what I want for you. I so bad want you to have that understanding that forgiveness is not about this dark and drudgery kind of thing, but it is about living in a way that is glorifying to God and experiencing his everlasting love and peace. And it's all about first acknowledging. We acknowledge that we have this sin. In verse five, David says, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave my inequity of my sin. And I love that part in there. It says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And it doesn't say you may forgive. It doesn't say that perhaps someday it says, and you forgave. He already knows that once he's laid it at God's feet, that it's forgiven. And that's the beauty of our relationship with Jesus Christ because once we have repented of our sins, once we have laid that, we already know, not that maybe he might forgive me, maybe if, there, if I go and do something extra in my life, if I go do something awesome or good or do some kind of insane work, that then maybe, then maybe he'll forgive me. No, he's saying, I have already forgiven you. So just lay it down. It does not make any sense to hold on to the things that God has already forgiven you. That is like me holding a chain around my neck and having a big padlock on it, but knowing that the padlock was already unlocked and all I gotta do is take the chain and drop it. Why carry it around in my life if it has already been excused from my life? It doesn't make any sense. So when we do that, we have to, like I said, we have to acknowledge that sin we have to be accepting that we did sin and that it was not the right thing. Next, we have to make sure that that sin is exposed because now we acknowledge it, we move that into exposure. We take it from the darkness, we take it from the light. David is a, a remarkable example of this because he says, I didn't cover this. I immediately moved it from darkness into light. I did not hide my sin. Next, we have to make sure that we go ahead and confess it. So we acknowledge it, we expose it, we put it in the light, and now we confess it. In other words, we give that to. So in that confession, that actual confession actually means that we're just, just saying, oh, I did this, but we're actually doing that confession actually means to cast it away, to cast it before God. So think of that, you know, like you're playing ball, right? And you, get, and you catch the ball and then you toss it away. That's what you do with that sin. You acknowledge that it's there. You expose it to the light. You cast it away. You confess it. You give it away. You do not confess and grab a hold of it and never let go of it. So once we do this, once we acknowledge it, once we expose it, once we cast it away, once we confess it, in doing so, we acknowledge that through that acknowledging and repentance that now we are free. We are free from physical deterioration because we already know just based on pure science that when we hold on to things, we become depressed. When we feel heavy guilt and shame, we actually feel depressed and it affects our physical body. We become sick physically. Next is that mental suffering goes away. So that anguish of being depressed, of having that relentless agony and torment that David talked about is released is gone. You do not have to hold on to it. You can take that agony, the one that is dragging you down, and now you can cast it back. Do not hold on to that sin because it will cause your mental breakdown. It will cause you mental 
suffering. It will also cause that spiritual separation. And this is what David speaks about. This Psalm 32 is heavily embedded with, and his, with, through his urgency in talking to God, it is actually through that expression that knowing that his sin has called, caused a great separation from God. And that's what sin does for us. It causes that deterioration, physical body, mentally and emotionally, it causes us to have a wrecked life. And then it causes us to be more and more distant from God. The longer you crave and you hold on to it, embracing the guilt and shame only allows for further and further and further separation from God. Do not hold on to your sin. Instead, live in the rhythm of God's forgiveness. When we hold on to that sin, it is a weighty sin. Sin, no matter how big or small you may think it is, it is a very weighty sin. And when we hold on to it, the only thing that we're proving is, is that we're delving into pride. Is we're thinking that by some measure, I can release myself. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to be able to release yourself from those heavy guilts and shames and sins that you've experienced. The only way that you are going to be able to get over it is by giving them to God. Do not hold on to those waiting sins. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all righteousness. If we confess our sins, he is just in forgiving us because of who he is. So that's what we look at when we see our sins being so heavy carried, we see in verse 10, it says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. So if you trust in the Lord, his salvation is with you, and he is the one that is just to forgive. So give those burdens to God. Stop carrying them on for yourself, because that's only who you're doing it for, is for yourself. Let them go. So in carrying those burdens, we often carry those that, of, of faults that we hold against others, ways that others have sinned against us. We hold on to those. So we first have to, in that act, in that living out, in the rhythm of God's forgiveness, we also have to let go of those things that people have sinned against us. We have to forgive. It does not matter whether they are asking us forgiveness or not, but we have to let those things go because oftentimes there will be people who sin against us or who cause uh, some kind of rift. We don't e they don't even know that they've done so. So of course, talking to them <laughs> would be step one. But other than that, I mean, we need to go ahead and let that go. We need to be the one to say, okay, God does not want me to hold on. He does not want me to break under this pressure. He wants for me to get rid of it. So just because someone may do something against you does not mean that you get to hold on to it. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16, it says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for the very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I know that I have done some crazy things and I would absolutely consider myself the least of these. I have had those times where I have held on to those things that people have done against me. But I acknowledge that I held on to those only because of my own pride. I can hold on to this because, well, now I have this against that person. But that's not the piece that God wants because when I hold on to that, it's like holding a, 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 a eroding battery in my hands. And if you know anything about the eroding battery and the acid starts pouring out, then I'm just burning myself. That's the only thing that you are doing by holding on to that sin. In Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, it states, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another as God in Christ for, forgave you. Because this is why we forgive, because we are forgiven. Let us forgive others because of what has been forgiven on our behalf. So what does it mean if you started to truly live in the rhythm of God's forgiveness? Perhaps you'll just live in a better rhythm of life, the one that is full of peace and that is 
truly centered in Christ. Perhaps it would mean that you would live a life that was not based in guilt or shame, but rather uh, one that is devoted to God, one that is centered on his love, the one that is unburdened by the things that you should never be carrying in the first place. Perhaps it would mean that you would live a life of absolute rejoicing, and then that's what I want for you. I want you to be able to live a life that is rejoicing. And just as David closed out Psalm 32 in verse 11, he said, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Rejoice and shout for joy. But we can only do that when we release all those burdens. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your unending grace, for the love that you bestow upon us each and every day. As the morning starts anew, everything is refreshed and ready to begin. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who was nailed to the cross, bled, died, and rose for us so that we who are rightful prisoners, who are rightful slaves, will set free. Help us to let go of every burden that sin has created in our life. Help us to release all the guilt, all the shame, all the sin, all the things that anybody has ever done to us. Help us to purge it, to lay it at your cross, to fall before your throne and just push it all to you to cast it away so that we may, as a body, as individuals, as prince and princesses in the faith, be wholly connected to you. Help us to let it go and to live in a life that is at the rhythm of your beautiful forgiveness. Amen. So, living in a living a life that's in God's for, at the rhythm of God's forgiveness we have to make sure that we let go of every barrier because we know that the barriers of sin that are so hard on us only separate us from truly singing out and living this beautiful song that God has created in us so let us move together in repentance and acknowledgement and letting it go to cast away all those barriers, all those sins that are suffocating our relationship with God.